Hello everybody and welcome back to Military Aviation History. It's your host Bismarck and this is part two of our Inside the Cockpit feature on the Messerschmitt ME 262. In part one we went over the history of this historic machine, we spoke about its design, its introduction, misconceptions and so on. And now we'll have a closer look at the design features I haven't talked about yet and then we will of course have a look inside the cockpit. Starting on the nose, the prominent opening we see there is for the gun camera. Uh, moving to the port wing, we've got the uh, pitot tube on the leading edge there for your speed measurements and of course navigational lighting, red here, which will be mirrored in green on the starboard side. Now you might have noticed these writings here before on German aircraft, nicht betreten, nicht schieben and nicht anfassen. They're essentially warnings, do not walk on, do not push and do not touch. Now above the wing on the port side, we also got the first fuel inlet for the front fuel tank here. Two additional ones can also be found behind the cockpit for the rear tank. Both tanks also have an auxiliary tank attached to them. The ring on the back would be for the Funkgerät 25A, the IFF system of the uh, ME262. Let's have a look at the gear space. Quite simple, straight pull and push with a flap to cover the lower half of each wheel. Front wheel and the gear space here, tricycle landing gear of the uh, ME262 of course. Again, it's a simple extend and retract, nothing fancy, rather simple to be honest. You also find two rectangular cutouts on each side of the front gear. These are the empty case dispensers for the 30mm MK108, of which the ME262 had four, at least in this configuration. And on the rear side of the fuselage, we also have flare dispensers operated by the pilot inside the cockpit. Then looking inside the rear fuselage, we've got the main compass, the Mutter compass, as it was known, and the radio equipment, the uh, Fernantrieb FA-16 Empfänger and Sender for the uh, Funkgerät FUG-16. Now what was nice at the museum is that several of the lower cover plates are detached, and this gave me a good look inside, and it was actually quite incredible being able to pop my head in there to the point where I nearly forgot to film at one stage. But what you'll see here is just the section in front of the pilot between him and the guns. In fact, if you look close, you'll also see a cutaway window there on the port side. Now these tubes are in this section just in front of what you just saw. Those are the uh, fuel pumps, one per each engine. And you'll also just be able to make out the rubber lining on the side of the tank there. Just below the pilot, another point of access but due to the removed cover sheets. Again, the cutaway window from earlier. And then we have the blue tank here for the compressed air. Lots of wiring in this section, of course, coming from the cockpit to the relevant systems, nicely kept together. Although I do imagine the SEP ties are not exactly World War II Luftwaffe standards. Very tidy though, very nicely maintained by the staff. And sometimes you do see some older cloth bands, which might still be visible here too. Okay, let's move a little bit to the outside again. Uh, inside of the wing here, you might already have wondered what 3116 Point five stands for in part one. Now that was the German code for the material that was used here. It's an aluminium zinc manganese alloy, the uh, standardized material used in various aircraft. And I believe the bird-like looking logo there is the company symbol of AWS, Aluminium Walzwerke Singen, so the producer of set uh, metal sheets. Believe it or not, there are actually cases in, well mainly south of Germany, where these alloy plates suddenly turn up randomly. Uh, being used for roof covers of old sheds and so on for many years and then suddenly somebody finds them. Here we have an old visual cue that is also used on the BF 109s. It's a visual reference line on the flap deflection of the actual flaps. Pilot can just look out of the cockpit, see the line here that he's riding and then he knows the deflection. And going over to the tail we also have a look at a trimming mechanism for the horizontal stabilizer deflection there. All right, let's hop inside. At least that's what I would normally do at this point, but I always yield to the preference of the owner who uh, kind of give us access to these aircraft. And for this one, it's such a rare bird, of course, that the museum was naturally hesitant. But they were kind enough for me to uh, be on the wing and film the inside of the cockpit there, which I greatly appreciate. I don't think they have done this before in Munich, um, at least not in recent memory, as far as I know. What you will see here is really the paradox of the ME262. You know, it's a jet, it's cutting edge for the time, but you can really see how they had to cut corners. And the cockpit is simple, it's spartanic, a bit clumsy even. 
No surprise here, some of these devices were built in little sheds in a forest somewhere by anyone the Germans had left, essentially, often forced labor. It's one thing to read about it, and it's the other to see how simple and awkward the cockpit actually is. But it is functional, and that's what counts in the end. You'll also find that essentially any picture of an original ME262 cockpit will have subtle to glaring differences even due to the decentralized production. So what we'll see here is essentially how this particular model is set up and it's only a guideline for other 262s, not that there are many left. So we have the seat, the shoulder straps, and I'll get to the control stick soon. We have armored glass up front. I presume the damage occurred over time. And those faint black lines outlining it are for the heating system, the defrosting system. A very simple holding string here for the canopy deploying outwards to starboard. Tell me if that reminds you of something. And we've got the Revy side up front. I'm not sure on this one. I'll need to ask the museum again. I'm not sure if it's an original. In any case, it is a Revy 16B, or it should be a Revy 16B. Notice the uh, functional but somewhat ungainly extended mounting bar there, which could be swiveled in some cases. All right, uh, port side control panel here. The flywheel there is for the rudder trim. The small yellow handles are the port and starboard fuel cock. Currently set to off, next position would be the aft fuel tank, fully moved forward would engage the front tank. The larger handles out of focus there are the throttles and the red handle would be the horizontal stabilizer trim. Moving forward then, we have red push buttons for flaps, top is to extend, bottom is to retract. The blue ones are for the gear, top to retract, bottom to deploy. The indicator to the left shows the compressed air reserve and the flywheel above that is to open the oxygen supply. The light indicators numbered E5 to E7 give you a visual return on the gear deployment, port, nose and starboard. Oxygen flow is then indicated by the lower blue dial and the top two showing the reserve of that uh, precious O2. The top red swivel here is for the emergency gear release and the lower one does the same for the flaps. And the handle to the right, that's the uh, front wheel brake, you can pull on that. Behind it would be the usual spot for a clock, missing here. The flick switch in the middle there would be or could be for the rocket assist takeoff. It also has this rogue label there saying compressed air. I don't know exactly why. Maybe this flick switch actually had a different use in this model. Front instrument board here we're going really simple. It's essentially a knot to the basic six. Nicely visible. These are mounted on a wooden panel by the way, just so you know. There's that uh, scarce resource issue again. Top left to top right, we've got your airspeed. Notice the break between the two 400 markings there. Uh, it shows TAS once you go above 400 kph. An artificial horizon and then your variometer or vertical speed. Bottom left to right, we've got the altimeter, the repeater compass, and then of course the home and indicator, the AFN2. Below that we see a vertical black stripe. That would be the ammo counter. Standardized, it would usually be a Schusszähler 100, the SZ100. Moving to the right of that, we've got the engine gauges, two for each. You'll actually see different versions of indicators for the same thing here. Although I cannot say if this is due to restoration or due to the original being like this. Up top, we've got the tachometers for the Jumo 04Bs. You'll notice a very faint, smaller inner scale going up to 3000 RPMs. That's used during startup. Left tachometer is also showing a red line on the outer scale just below 9,000 RPM. Straight down black dials, those are exhaust gas temperature gauges. To either side of those, brown dials, the exhaust gas pressure. The brown dials below those, we've got the oil pressure. And then working inwards, the black dials, we've got the fuel injection pressure gauges. Yellow gauges on the bottom showing the fuel reserves in liters. Left one for the rear, right one for the front. The small holes to either side would usually house a fuel warning lamp and usually to the right of the right yellow gauge. You'd also find a heating selector for the cockpit, but Germany had other things to worry about in 1945, I guess. Might also have been removed during restoration. Below all that, we have the central pedestal with the SWA-10B, the Auslöser Schrittschaltwerk. That's essentially a fancy German way of saying that with this, the pilot would operate the R4M rocket system. Left flick switch arms the system. The right flick switch allows continuous fire instead of set salvos. The fighter bomber version of the ME262 would also have a similar pedestal, a Zünderschaltkasten for the bombs in this position. Let's move to the starboard side control panel. We've got push buttons for the plane's electrical system, such as radio, navigational lights, and a lot. The switches below that are for the front glass heating and the flares. And you'll also see an emergency jettison for the canopy. Various dials and switches for the radio, the IFF, 
And then of course we have the engine starters and tachometer bush buttons. Even though this particular aircraft was only used as a fighter, there was an emergency jettison for the bombs. This was standard. As mentioned in part one, the ME262 was actually planned to have bombs many months before Hitler ever saw it as part of revised specifications to the industry. More information on that in the previous video. Final piece of the puzzle here, the control stick. I'm a bit unsure about this one. Usually when you swing back the safety catch, it deploys as a trigger switch for the main guns. The now uncovered top button would probably be for the rocket release, while the button to the left of that would be optional for bombs. Depends how it's wired, of course, but that's my best take. It's Luftwaffe standard and the handbook indicates this as well. The small button for your pinky is for the radio, while the big offset button is to load or rather charge the cannons. All right, that brings us up to a close. Congrats on passing this crash course on the uh, 262. I hope you all enjoyed it. Consider subscribing and hitting that bell button so you can get a notification when the next video goes live. Got a bunch of cool videos coming up. And if you want to have early access to those or simply support the channel, you can also do so via Patreon or PayPal. Information in the description below. A big thank you to the Deutsche Museum in Schleisheim. Give it a visit, it's worth it. All the information is in the description below. And as always, have a great day, good hunting and see you on the sky.